go. All right, so what I always like to do is I like to let the stream start for a minute or so just to make sure that the sound is working, um, the video is working, because as you can imagine, if it's not, kind of a big deal, don't you think? So we'll get started here in just a second. We're talking about transposition today, but while we're getting started, ooh, that was a little bit loud, uh, let me say hello to Laredo. Anybody else out there today, I know this transposition lesson probably isn't going to be the most well attended, I would think, because a lot of people probably, maybe not even sure what it is, but we'll see how it goes. We got 10 people in now, so we're doing pretty good. All right, looks pretty good. Sounds pretty good. Let me adjust my hat a little bit, maybe. Um, there we go. All right, let me take a drink, and then uh, we're going to get started here. Hey, Joan's here. Welcome out, Joan. Okay, let me get the Facebook stream started. It should take about 20 seconds or so, and then uh, we'll be ready to go. Um, so yeah, just give me 20 seconds. Hello students, your piano teacher Tim here. Welcome to our classroom piano lessons on the web. It's your first time out watching on Facebook. Make sure you like our page. If you're watching over on YouTube, make sure that you are subscribed. You have all notifications turned on by hitting that bell because we have new lessons coming out all the time and you don't want to miss a beat. So today we are talking about um, transposition here and uh, hello to Patty Cake apparently. Um, all right, everybody, let me uh, get my notes up. They are up already, actually. Ooh, let me fix that. Uh, just a second or so. There we go. Not bad, not bad, not bad. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to do an intro, and then we'll get right on to it. It's actually going to be kind of a short lesson today. Um, it will not take a whole lot of time to explain this, because it's pretty simple. Okay, here we go. Your piano teacher, Tim, here. You may have heard about transposition, and you need to know what it's about. Well, today, I'm going to help you understand just that. Let's get to it. Okay, trying out that shorter intro. Uh, okay, I was looking over my notes really quick. So, I need to explain what is transposition. Well, transposition is when you take a section of music and you basically translate it to a different key um, basically playing the same note patterns just in a different spot let me show you so um, basically the most basic one i can show you is the five finger pattern just over c and you as you may know as you're playing from c up to g and then back down now let's say we want to play it over g so now we're in g before we played it in c which has zero sharp zero flats now we're going to play it in G. It's very, very important that we adhere to any of the um, sh possible sharps or flats we may encounter in that key. Now, you may not know this, but the key of G major has one sharp, F sharp. So when we move over to G and play our five finger pattern, we have transposed it to G now. Um, so why didn't I play an F sharp? Well, in that little pattern, there aren't any Fs, so you don't have to worry about it. However, if you move it to, say, D, right? Now I'm going to play it without any sharps or flats, and I'm going to see if you notice a difference in the sound. Ooh, didn't sound quite the same, did it? It's because that was bright and happy, bright and happy. Ooh, something was off there. So now that we've moved to D, we have to adhere to the key signature D major, which I'm just going to tell you because you know the keys are a different lesson all on its own that the key of d has two sharps f sharp and c sharp so therefore i do have an f in this pattern so i gotta sharp it and as you can see when i did that now they all match in the general kind of sound now why do you have to adhere to the different sharps and flats 
Well, it's the same reason that different keys have different sharps and flats. And the whole reason behind that is it's all about maintaining the same distance relationships between the notes. So you may have heard about whole steps and half steps, also known as semitones and whole tones. A half step is just, or a semitone, is when you move up to the very next note on the piano. Now a whole step, or a whole tone, is when you move up two half steps, right? Makes sense. Two halves make a whole. Now that's why between E, um, there, between E and F, you got to be careful because that's only a half step. So E, a whole step above E would be F sharp. So here we go. I'm going to break down the um, intervallic relationship or the distance relationship in the five finger pattern we just played. So between C and D, moving back to C for a second. That's a whole step. You got another whole step, a half step, and then a whole step. So we had whole step, whole step, half step, whole step. So two holes, a half, and then a whole step. Moving it to D. So we need to maintain that same relationship. So we need two holes. So you start on D. You need whole step. You need another whole step. That's why there's an F sharp in the key of D. So it maintains that same distance relationship. And if you maintain that distance relationship, it translates to the same kind of sound over um, between, between what you're transposing to. So anyway, you start in D, you got whole step, whole step. And remember, then I said half step, whole step. So that's why. If you think about it, the perfect example of transposition is, are the scales that we play, right? So just playing the whole scale now, um, the, the relationship is whole step, whole step, half step, whole step, whole step, whole step, half step. So when I move it to, um, say, E, for example, you need two whole steps. So that's why there's F sharp and C sharp, half step, and then three whole steps. That's why there's a C sharp and D sharp back to, you know, your half step to bring you back to the starting note. All right, um, let me make sure everything is good. I'm just looking over my notes right now. Make sure I didn't forget anything because that's pretty important. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, okay. All right, here we go. Okay, I got that. All right, so I explained everything. This is like that was like the basics of how transposition works. Pretty easy to understand. Now I'm going to um, kind of show you maybe a little, like a couple little segments of some pieces that you might know. I'll do uh, two examples I think work pretty good. So the example of Jingle Bells. Normally Jingle Bells is in the key of C. You can see it in other keys though, but you know it generally starts like this. So if I move that, and I tran say I want to transpose that little segment, right? I'm going to transpose it to G. Now the thing we got to keep in mind is what? That G has an F sharp in it. But we haven't really moved out of that five finger pattern we were talking about. So we don't really have to worry about it. However, with D, you got that F sharp in there. How about over A? How about B? Wait, that didn't sound quite right. So the problem with B is within that five finger pattern, there's actually two sharps because there's five total sharps in the key of B, F, C, G, uh, F, C, G, D, and A, I had to count them. Um, so there's the D and the F sharp. And actually a C sharp as well. So if you forget about the C sharp, that'll mess you up. So um, it's pretty easy to keep track of between C, F, and G because they don't really use um, any of the sharps or flats in that key. But once you start moving out to um, like B, F sharp, things like that, you'll have to be a little bit more cognizant of that. So that's what I want you to do as like a practice, is take a small segment of a piece you know, or maybe even the whole piece, and then I want you to transpose it to as many keys as you can, just to start to get the idea of transposition. Um, if you really want, it, it really helps to become good at transposition for one main reason, and that is, well, two main reasons. One, it gives you a better understanding of how each key is set up. So you'll really have to engage your brain 
and be like, okay, now I'm thinking in the key of B. Okay, I have these five sharps now. I got to look out for it. And I'm still trying to maintain the same pattern between each hand. So it's good for that. It's also great if you ever play for a band, if you play for an orchestra or um, a choir or something, and they throw upon you all of a sudden, okay, I know your, your piece is written in the key of A, but now we're going to play it in the key of B or the key of B flat. So you have to know what you're doing there. And the better you can get at transposition, the better off you'll be. Transposition admittedly is something I could practice uh, quite a bit more because when I do it, it still really tickles my brain and really, really makes me think hard, but that's good. The more, um, it's kind of like working out, right? Like the more you strain yourself, well, in a good way, you don't want to hurt yourself, but the more like weight you add to a point, um, the more you're going to get out of it. So the more thinking that goes on, the better off you'll be. All right, let me do another example. Now this one's going to be a little bit harder for me because I just tried it <laughs> and it was, it was kind of difficult. I'm not going to lie, even though it's a, it's an easy piece. Um, but all right, we'll cut that part out like that little, then we'll start here. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. Let me look it over for a second. Uh, okay. Okay, here we have the Minuet in G by uh, Petzold. A lot of people think it's by Bach. It is in the style of Bach. But anyway, that's not the point. So you're playing this. Uh, we're going to take like the first line or so of this thing. And I'm just going to play it like normal first. I know I'm not playing the ornaments right now. That's not the point of the lesson because I always get comments about that. But anyway, that's how you play it there. And then let's say I want to play it over the key of A. Now the thing is, is translating it between the um, sheet music and then my hands can be a little tricky because there's a couple of things to keep in mind. First thing to keep in mind is that um, think about how far away A is, the key we're moving to, to G. Well, it's just one note shifted up, right? So every note is shifted up a whole tone. So you can think of it that way. So kind of like while you're reading the music, you almost have to translate everything up a whole step. It actually really helps to memorize whatever you are trying to um, transpose, but I don't have this quite memorized, so I'm just going to kind of do it from sight. The other thing we have to keep in mind, the second main thing, is uh, how many sharps now are in the key that we're transposing to. So the key of A, I'm just going to tell you right now, has three sharps, F, C, and G. So I got to be careful of whenever those occur. So let me try to play this. I'm going to play it a lot slower than I normally would. And uh, we're just going to take a look and see how it goes. Notice how it basically sounds the same. And notice how I had to play it a lot slower because there's just more processing going on in my brain. If I practice this type of thing every day, I would get quite a bit faster at it, and so will you. All right, let's move it to a different key. Ooh, this is going to be a little bit tricky. Let's move it from the key of G to the key of B flat now. So now everything, you just kind of want to determine how far apart those keys are. So um, the difference between G and B is one, two, three, or one and a half whole tones, or three semitones can be kind of hard to keep track of. So we'll see how I do here. So now my starting position is right here. I got to keep in mind now that I have two flats, B flat and E flat. So let's see what happens here. Uh, hopefully I don't miss it too bad, but here we go. Oh, forgot the E flat. So let me try again. See, this is what I was talking about. Oh, oh, that's why. Okay. Okay, I'm getting. I'm gonna try this again. Obviously. Oh man, I'm messing up so bad. All right, let me keep trying. So that's uh, obviously one of the keys of that.
All right, I did better. I'm going to keep trying it, and then a message to my editor. We'll just edit in the best, uh, best playthrough of these. All right, here we go. So there we go. I finally got it. Took a couple playthroughs, but that's what's going to happen, especially as you try as you move to keys that are a little bit more difficult to keep track of, like moving from sharp keys to flat keys, moving from something with very few sharps to something with a lot of sharps. That might confuse you more, but just keep at it and make this a regular part of your practice. Just you know, like each time you practice, just take a line of your music and see how many keys you can transpose it to. Quite the brain workout. All right, I'm going to check in with the chat here and see how we go. All right, uh, ba -ba -ba, D Dorian, that's what I say when I forget to play the chopper number of sharps in D. Well, you could do that. So there's different modes, so you could use that excuse for sure. Um, oh, let me bring up what everybody's doing here. Um, let's see. Sirius says, how can I understand which key I should put my finger on? I mean, when you transpose the C to G. Okay, so here's the thing. That's a good question. Um, let me see if I can explain this well. So hold on. Um, and hello to everybody, by the way. Let me bring this up. Okay, so the question was, how do I know like, what note to start on depending on what key that I'm in? And this is how you do it. So um, I'm just going to take the right hand here. I'm going to play the first note just as written. Oops, let me show you like what I'm doing. So I'm going to play the first note as written, D. And then I have this like five finger pattern over D, or over G rather, because I'm in G position here. So the thing is I'm playing D, D is my first note. And you got to ask yourself, what note of the scale is that starting note? Well, it's the fifth note, right? One, two, three, four, five. So therefore, when I transpose it, say, to A, my starting note is going to be five notes five notes up the scale from the scale that I'm doing. One, two, three, four, five. So you're just going to have to do your best to translate, like figure out, okay, what note of the scale was I playing before? And it has to be that same number on the different scale. So for example, let's do another one. Same, um, same measure here you know, fifth note up the scale. Let's say I want to transpose it to the key of E. So what we have to do is go to E. It helps to know your scales, but I'll tell you that the fifth note of the E scale is B. So that's where I'm gonna start, is the fifth note up there. And then you go to, you have the five finger position just over E. So like I said, it's a little confusing. You're gonna have to use like a little, a lot of thinking for sure, especially in the beginning. The easier of a piece that you can choose to begin transposing to, the better off you are. Again, scales is a great way to start with transposition, and perhaps you've been practicing a little bit of transposition this whole time, and maybe you didn't even know it. So um, yeah, start with scales. Uh, maybe even just do like the five finger pattern thing I showed you in the beginning. Because I know my scales so well, that's why I'm, you know, crushing it with these whoops there we go but like I said it can always help to practice them in as many keys as you can and then pick out like an easy piece like jingle bells or maybe something that you learned a couple months ago and uh, transpose it to something you know reasonable okay hopefully that helps you out I think it should Uh, ba -ba -ba Laredo says, Tim, is transposition similar to improvisation, and why is there a need to transpose certain keys or scales? So I did uh, explain the reason why. Um, the reason to transpose to certain keys or scales, um, well, actually, I didn't mention this part. In music, you're going to find transpositions and modulations. The modulation is like what the key changes in the piece and then you're transposing it to that key sometimes. Um, so 
the need to transpose to different keys is that first of all pieces do that so you have to be ready for that you you will find pieces where they introduce a segment in a certain scale and then they'll introduce the same segment it's actually really common in pop music they'll move it up to a key usually a third up so like if the piece is in b they'll move it up to d or d sharp um, uh, and then the other reason, um, this one might not apply to a lot of people, but if you play in a band or a group, really helpful to know transposition on the spot because they may have a sheet for you that's in the key of E, but they may throw you a curveball and be like the, the composer may, or the director, I almost call him the dictator, <laughs> might say, uh, let's play it in a different key. And so then you'll know how to do that. The other one, the other example I mentioned is um, it's good for your brain, right? It's just really good workout for your brain to think all of those relationships between the notes. And then um, is it similar to improvisation? Uh, kind of, right? Because when you improvise, you have to think about what key that you're in. You have to think about maybe uh, the relationships between the notes, how far apart they are. So they are similar. Um, improvisation is really just making up you know, stuff on the spot. That's really just... That's really the, the basis behind it, where transposition is just moving a certain pattern, the same pattern, you're not you know, making anything up, to a different spot and playing the same pattern of notes. Okay, Charles says, the closer the keys are in the circle of fifths, the easier they are to transpose. So true. They share more common chords. Oh, I didn't think about that, but that is a good point. Another good reason to learn the circle of fifths. I agree. I agree. So is, this is the example where knowing intervals is helpful. Um, yes, knowing intervals is extremely helpful in transposition because like I said, you're really thinking about how far apart these notes are from one another. Um, Bullet Caution Productions uh, asks, are there any key registers that are least common? Is B flat the hardest fingering for keys? Uh, yeah. B flat's one of the harder ones, and then are there any key registers that are least common? Yeah, like B flat, F sharp's one that's probably not as common. Like anything that's high up in the sharps and, and flats is usually less common. If I'm understanding the question correctly, I think I got it. Uh, all right, let's keep uh, scrolling up, see if I can answer some more questions about this. Uh, John says, thanks, you're welcome. Laredo, I asked, I answered that one. Ashish says, thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. Charles says, I had a song that makes the largest possible key jump. It went from B flat to B. I used a F sharp uh, sus chord in one measure to change key tone. Oh, well, that's interesting. Okay, that's very cool. Actually, some of the ones where it's like very tiny of a movement, like from B flat to B, those I feel, well, and you just said that it's like a big key jump, even though if you look on the piano, you're like, well, how's that a big key jump? It's only a half step. Well, you have to keep in mind that B flat has two only two flats and B has five sharps. So as you can see in the five finger pattern, there's quite a big difference here in the notes that you'll play. So it's actually, um, for everybody else uh, to kind of get the context that it is a pretty big deal. Uh, Kathy says, oh, this is how I am with new pieces and their proper key. The struggle is real. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. You'll get there. Just keep working at it, and you'll get a better and better understanding on how all of this works. I feel like this lesson turned out pretty good. Not to toot my own horn. Uh, Doc Dose, or um, I'm going to call you Dose. Says two words, transpose button. Oh, the, I can't show you because it's out of frame. But there is literally a transpose button on my keyboard and other keyboards as well, where if you press it and you press another note, it like it automatically transposes it. Don't do that. Uh, it kind of eliminates a lot of the um, mental benefit that you're going to get from actually thinking this stuff out. And once again, if you're playing in a band and they say change keys and you don't have your magic keyboard in front of you, you're kind of SOL now, aren't you? Although I remember um, back in math class, they wouldn't let us use the um, calc. That's what it's called, calculator. It's been so long. Because the teacher will always be like, well, you're not going to have a calculator in your pocket all the time, are you? It's like, yeah. Wait, where the hell is it? 
I don't have it in the room with me. It's not here. I don't have a calculator in my pocket. But the the whole uh, point of it is um, that the the phone now every phone has like a calculator in it, pretty much. So it's kind of funny that how wrong they were. You know what they, else they were wrong about when they told me that you, oh, you're going to use cursive all throughout your life, like in elementary school, like when kids are like, "Why do we have to learn this? This doesn't make any sense." And they're right. And um, the teacher's like, "You're going to use this all the time." I, you know what I only use uh, cursive for is to sign my checks. That's that's it, pretty much. To sign my name, uh, that's about it. I know some people disagree with that. So I, I've I talked with friends about that, and I talked with one friend about it, and she's like, but I do use cursive all the time because I write correspondence and letters, and it's like, okay, like, okay, 1% of the population uses cursive. <laughs> Good lesson. Thank you, Tim. Marcel. Please teach by playing Pateran. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I can't do that today. I want to play Mary Did You Know and see how do I transpose. Well, follow the lesson I just um, put out in front of you today. Do your best on it. Um, especially pay attention to the part I mentioned a few minutes ago about your starting position and the notes that you're doing. Think about those notes in the relation to the key that you're in. So if I'm playing in the key of C, right, and my first note's a G, well, I would determine that, okay, that's five notes up the G scale. So when I transpose the same thing to D, I have to do five notes up the D scale. <laughs> and then, um, let's see, uh, Phil Ewell says handwriting and casculators dead <laughs> i agree handwriting who needs it right uh john uh says i want to that was another thing they used to give me grief about was my handwriting and oh my goodness it's gonna be such a big deal guys you gotta learn how to spell you're not gonna have a spell check in front of you all the time like you do on the computer and it underlines it in red and then you can fix it right away it just doesn't happen but to be fair they didn't have all this technology back in the day and um yeah <laughs> Enough, enough ragging on my third grade teachers. Uh, Learning with Rich says, good to be back again here. Hopefully there will be a topic for chord progression. Um, not, I don't know if there is any time soon, but let me do this. I may have gotten this for you before. I don't quite remember, but I'm going to find you guys a lesson that I did a while back. So just give me a second. Progression. And then a little pro tip for everybody. If you ever want to know if I came out with a lesson ever, what you do is you go to the YouTube search bar, you type in whatever topic you want. So I just typed in chord progression and then lessons on the web. And uh, that usually will bring you to, um, to what you need. Okay, progression. There you go. So check out that lesson. Um, that's probably the closest you'll get right now. I'll probably will do another um, chord progression lesson somewhat in the f sometime near in the near future. All right, uh, Felipe Slot says, "Hey Tim, finally managed to be on time for a live lesson. How's everybody doing? I'm doing great. Glad to have you here today." Charles says, "We had to write pieces uh, to people in oh write notes. I have the the." Uh, the, the word piece is in my head so much. I say it so much. Uh, we had to write notes to people in cursive. There was a time before the internet, and though this was not known as the Dark Ages, but it was known as the... I'm trying to think of something clever to say, but it's not coming. Um, the Gray Ages, right? Actually, believe it or not, I lived in a day where that was the thing. So I'm and I'm not that old, so I'm not that young either, but definitely not um <laughs> definitely not definitely not a boomer. Not that there would be a problem if I was. Uh let's see here. Looking through to see like um I apologize if I missed any comments or questions. Oh yeah, yeah. What's funny is is Dase, uh actually uh, answered the thing that I said about you know not using the transposition button. 
Uh, Filthy Will says, 70s and 80s babies get the best of both worlds. Yes, that is true. I'm lucky that as an 80s baby that um, I know technology so well because I know a lot of people my age that do not. Well, well, people that born in the 80s generally know technology well enough, but eh, I don't know. I Well, I've been studying. I, I, I like... My background is that um, obviously I went to music school um, for my undergrad, but then I went to graduate school for IT, um, information technologies. It was just basically computers. And back when I was like in middle school, I used to build computers um, and help my brother actually. He had a computer business and I would help him like put new versions of Windows on the computers. And back then it was actually kind of a pain in the butt because uh, computers were not as reliable as they are today and it took a lot longer to install. But um, but there's that, and then I would just mess around on the computer all the time, mess around with coding a little bit. I'm not big into coding, but I have a really good understanding on how, like, um, computer stuff works, um, getting peripherals to work, you know, getting everything um, set up. And so I'm pretty good at that, and I have a really good understanding on, like, how um, – pretty decent understanding on, how, like, how networks work and things like that. So I'm kind of a computer hobbyist, not the biggest in the world, but – that's pretty much why uh, the YouTube channel is what it is. I also know quite a bit about marketing, and uh, I'm kind of an all-around guy. But anyway, enough about me and gloating about my background. Uh, let's see, Tuts B Jack. I'm just gonna call you Jack. How have you made any videos on left or right hand independency? I do. I do. I'll look this up. But once again, you know, the pro tip, I'm just going to type in hand independence, and I spelled it wrong, but hey, that's what I was, that was my point earlier, that it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, okay, let's take a look here. Da, da, da. Um, you know what, I kind of have to make another one on hand independence, it looks like. Yeah, you know what? I'll have to make another one. I, I do I like I have a lesson that popped up here, but I'm not I'm not really a fan of that lesson to be honest with you. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna try it again. Alright, um so yeah, no, I don't have one just yet. I majored in IT, started college at age 39. Well, that's great, Kathy. That's actually really inspiring because I think a lot of people at 39 think that it's um, like too late to go to school for anything. So that's great that you did that. That's really cool. That's why I started piano at age 60. So you learned, okay, so you learned uh, IT, you majored in IT quite some time ago. Uh, but that's awesome. That's really inspiring. And thank you for sharing that. Tim, are you going to do further lessons on jazz? Uh, perhaps someday. Not not right away. Um, but yeah, I sure will. Still working on that music analysis course, though. Some weeks I get a lot of time to work on it. Some, not as much. But at least I'm making progress towards it now. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do is we'll stick around for another bit or so. Uh, what I want to do, though, is I want to kind of just tell you guys what's going on with all this stuff. Um, so I want to talk right now about the community tab. So on my website, real quick, I have over 20 courses designed to help you learn a lot more about piano music. If you really like the stuff on the YouTube channel, you're really going to want to check out these courses. So just go to pianolessonsontheweb.com, kind of read about what my courses can offer for you. Use code YouTube during checkout to get 15% off. So I'm not going to talk a lot about that right now, but what I want to really talk about right now is going to the community tab and kind of showing you what this tab is all about. So this tab is the calendar of the upcoming live streams. Uh, today we have transposition and then um, Friday, next Friday we have sight reading apps. It looks like I'm taking that Sunday off. And then that final Friday of the month, um, we will be doing the student showcase, which would be right after Thanksgiving. So submit, um, if you guys don't know what the student showcase is, it's where you submit, um, or students submit recordings that they're playing to me throughout the month. And then I give feedback on them live during the live stream. Yes, 
the live during the live stream. And um, I'm going to share with you, you know, some constructive criticism as well as what I like about your playing. I always like to kind of, what do they call it, a compliment sandwich. I like to do that. Uh, mainly because, like, I have had things in the past where I played for somebody and I thought, like, something I was playing was wrong, but they, but it was actually right. So that's why I always like to tell students, like, okay, this is where you can improve, but this is what I liked about it and this is what I think you should keep doing. So I'm going to do that during the student showcase. So um, that's on the 29th. You can submit recordings to me, um, facebook.com slash lessons on the web. You can um, send me a like, contact form there or a, a, the messenger there. You can uh, submit the recordings to me, Tim, at LessonsOnTheWeb.com. Or, well, those two places are probably the best. Or like on Twitter or something. Like if you have a link um, to a video, just send it to me. Or you can attach it to an email if the file size is small enough. Okay. Tim, I need help with my left hand. It is so weak, I sometimes shake. I promise on brain bandage. I promise on brain bandage that I know of. What? <laughs> I, th I just misunderstand the question, I think. Uh, Tim, I need help with my left hand. It is so weak, it sh sometimes shake. Okay, I get that part. I promise on brain bandage that I know of. Okay, I don't get that part. But I think I got the part that... Probably the part of the question that you're trying to say. Um, okay, with my left hand, it's so weak that it sometimes shakes. Okay, so, um, I'm going to assume you don't have any kind of, um, you know, what is that called? Michael J. Fox had it, has it, um, Parkinson's or something like that, because obviously that would make your hand shake, and that's a whole different thing you'd have to deal with with a doctor, but, um, so the thing is, and that it's very normal also for weak muscles to shake, so it's probably a muscle issue, I would imagine. You know, so um, the key to it is to just play more or, or what I would do actually is take your scales and just play your scales with your left hand, you know, play them maybe three times each. And then, yeah, if your hand muscles are weak in your left hand, they will start to shake for sure. Um, but that will strengthen your hand muscles and they will get better with time. Oh, uh, Crystal says, I promise I don't have brain damage. I thought that's what you were saying, but, <laughs> but I actually think the funniest part about that statement is you're saying I don't have brain damage, but what you really said was I promise on brain bandage that I know of, <laughs> which uh, you might have been doing like the, the – uh, I do that sometimes with the cell phone. I'll do like the text-to-chat thing or the, the voice-to-chat, and it will like mix up the words or something, but – as long as when I'm just typing, it does that. But anyway, I would do that. Um, another thing you need to keep in mind is that when you're playing and you're trying to get more volume out of the hand that you're playing on, don't rely so heavily on you know using your your finger muscles as much. You actually want to have a little bit of like a kind of a bouncing. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. You want to uh, like a little bit, a kind of like a dropping your forearm and using the weight of your forearm to hit the notes. That will alleviate some of the strain off of your fingers. Because a lot of students, when they first play, do that. They, they really, it's all here, which is not what you want to do. You want it here. You want it like kind of a mix, right? So you, obviously there will be some muscles going on there but you want to start relying more on your forearm. I think that will help you out as well, especially to reach the black keys. Yeah, so yeah, just do what I said, like little scale exercises using more of your forearm strength. Okay, Charles says, I have the same left hand issue. I use hand in at super slow tempo to correct this. So yeah, try that as well. Speaking of marketing, the t-shirt significant? No, the t-shirt is not significant. Today's uh, lesson is not brought to you by Mr. Pib. Although, you know, I, I, I actually bought a couple of these shirts, these like uh, soda, like these old um, soda branding shirts. 
as it, as kind of a marketing thing because I was thinking that if I wore these around people, like people, and not like online or anything, like people I know in real life, what they're going to start to do, so actually it is kind of a branding thing. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, so what I was thinking of, because um, part of branding is you want to get into people's heads. And so when they're thinking about other things and something that reminds you of them comes up, they'll think of your brand. And believe it or not, all of us are a personal brand, right? I'm the Tim brand and I have these certain qualities to me that people know about. And, you know, so the what I was thinking was is by getting these shirts and wearing them around people is people will start to uh, like catch on and be like, oh, he always wears like a soda shirt. So he always wears like a Coca-Cola, a Sprite or a Mr. Pibb shirt. Um, I haven't really been keeping up with this. This is just like an idea I had that I kind of abandoned. But um, but the, the idea is then is soda brands are probably like one of the most well-known brands. So when people drive down the street, they get a, a soda or whatever at a restaurant, or I mean drive down the street and see a billboard or something and see a brand of soda, they're going to think about me. <laughs> that was the idea behind it. So there is a little bit of a marketing thing there. There is no marketing significance in terms of the channel or anything. I just wanted to wear it because it was kind of fun. Kind of a fun shirt. I feel like uh, I feel like it looks pretty good on camera, actually. So, but that that's you did get me on that. I, I forgot about that. Um, but no, nothing. We are not brought to you by Mr. Pib today. I think I've had maybe one Mr. Pib in my whole life. I think it's like Dr. Pepper, right? It's like an off-brand Dr. Pepper. Uh, I also have a Dr. Pepper shirt. Uh, Loretta says, this is definitely a great lesson, Tim. Thank you. Truly appreciate it. I do find that my fourth finger tends to be weak. Okay. One of my attendants in the anatomical stuff, snuff box, is constantly painful though. Ooh. So yeah, if you're suffering from tendonitis, that's like a doctor thing. I can't uh, give you too much of a, too much help on that. All right. You're very welcome. But yeah, uh, my main interests are like music, like piano and music, and then two is probably like IT, and then three is like uh, online marketing and branding. Oh, and I love making um, thumbnails in Photoshop, but I'm not like a I'm not like a graphic designer or anything like that. So maybe I should wear these shirts in my videos now so you guys, so the uh, the marketing um, or the branding idea will, will work on you guys. Perhaps a hand massage, massage could help. It could be. I, I'm a, very reluctant on giving people like any kind of advice like that, just because I, I <clears throat> you know, I don't want to mess with the uh, medical stuff. Get in trouble that way. All right, everybody. I think I'm gonna cash out today. It was a great lesson. Um, oh, let me do a outro. Um, cause <laughs> so I don't forget. Um, so here we go. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. oh yeah, 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 key signatures and stuff. Okay, so here we go. To get the most out of today's lesson, you need to understand about key signatures and the relationships between them. Well, you want to definitely check out this playlist right here because it's going to catch you up. Your piano teacher, Tim, here. Thank you so much for coming by today, and I'll see you, yes, you, in the next lesson. Got a root beer shirt? No, I do not. I don't have an A and W. Or, that would be a good one, huh? I think so. Um, okay, I think that's it for today, everybody. Thanks for coming by. I'll see you um, next Friday for whatever lesson that was. <laughs> what lesson is that? Let me see. Uh, sight reading apps. So we'll be talking about sight reading apps then. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for coming by today. I'll see you Friday, and have a good one.